Hey guys, it's Cece, and today I am talking about my favorite books that I read in 2018. It is finally here, the long-awaited video. People have already been asking me if I was gonna make this this year. Don't worry, I'm just a little bit more behind on yearly videos than I usually am around this time in January. So I have some favorite books to talk about. I'm going to be talking about 11 total, and all of these books I have given four and a half or five stars to throughout the year. Actually, this is going to be every four and a half or five star book that I read this year. It was a little easier to make this list than it normally is, and I think it's because I read about half as many books as I normally do, so there were just a lot more standouts than there have been in years previous. It was easier to look at the year as a whole and go, these are the best books that I read. I'm going to be doing this list almost in order of how much I liked them. The only exception to this rule is the first couple books I'm going to talk about are both 2019 releases, and for some reason it just made sense in my brain when I was making this list to keep those separate from the other books. I don't know why, it just felt like books that I read before their release, it always feels a little weird to me to include those in a list of books that have already been released. I don't know if that's just a me thing, but I wanted to keep the 2019 books separate so I could still talk about how much I liked them, but they aren't part of my main list where I'm counting up to my absolute most favorite book of the year, if that makes sense to you. It made sense to me when I made this list, so. And I've actually already filmed this video once and hated how it turned out, so cross your fingers for me that this is the one that goes well. I would say that a vast majority of these books are queer in in fact, I think only two of them don't explicitly feature an absolute queer main character, which is about, you know, standard for me. But with all that out of the way, let's talk about my top 11 books that I read in 2018. Oh, and if you guys have guesses as to which books are going to be on this list, you should pause the video and go guess down below and then come back and see if you were right. I know at least one book was incredibly obvious from the thumbnail, but I want to see how many others you can predict. 11 books, go guess. Okay, let's start with the two 2019 releases. So the first 2019 release that I want to talk about is The Poison Within by Rachel Marie Piercy. This book is actually already out. It came out very, very first thing in January. You can already go and buy yourself a copy. And this is a favorite for a lot of reasons. There are a lot of layers to what made me love this book. So first things first, let me tell you what it's about. This is a redemption storyline about an evil queen. So there is this queen that is running from her kingdom. She has a really terrible reputation as being the Black Queen, like she's done all these horrible things, and she ends up running to this forest called the Ashen Forest in order to escape an assassin that's been sent after her. At the Ashen Forest, she is given refuge, and she also happens to meet uh, the princess of this land, and the two of them start to possibly fall for each other while Raya is struggling against those feelings while she wants to eventually leave and regain her kingdom, but now she's starting to find roots in this new place. So this book has a lot of things going for it in terms of things that make up my favorite books. It is a queer romance, it is fantasy, it's it's very fairy tale esque but also I was an editor for this book and this is the first book that I've edited in full that has since been released into the world and so like it's also a favorite just for me personally I think it's gorgeously written and wonderful but also like this was kind of a big thing for me because I've wanted to be an editor uh, my entire life basically and it was really cool to actually be part of doing the thing I have wanted to do. There are other things that I think stand out about this book. I love Rachel's first book, Axiom, but the entire time reading The Poison Within, even when I was just doing edits of it, I was thinking on every single page how much stronger Rachel's writing has gotten with this book. Her descriptions are gorgeous, but ultimately it's these characters that I really fell in love with. I love redemption storylines. I love the way that the backstory of Raya is fit in with sort of her trying to move forward. I also love stories where friendships, relationships, love is something that helps a person to change the world around them. It's a theme that comes up fairly often in books, but it's a favorite of mine, so I love it every time that I read it. So yeah, I just loved uh, every single part of this book, and I hope that you pick it up now that it's available. The other 2019 release I want to talk about is I Wish You All the Best by Mason Deaver. So this, unlike The Poison Within, is not out yet. It doesn't come out until May, but... I think a lot of people are excited for it, and it's for good reason. So this book is about Ben DeBacker, who comes out to their parents as non-binary, 
and in response their parents kick them out. And Ben is forced to contact estranged sister Hannah and uh, they move in with Hannah and her husband. So it's like a rough start, but then it's also about Ben starting a new school, meeting new people, making friends with a boy named Nathan who they really like. And like that's one of the things I wanted to talk about with this book is that it covers incredibly difficult topics. It starts on such a difficult point, but this is ultimately a book about acceptance and love. I think that that is a really meaningful statement to make considering that this is an own voices story. Mason, the author, is also non-binary and so this book is being published by Scholastic. It's being published by a big name publisher and it's difficult and it deals with difficult queer topics but it is ultimately full of joy and full of trying to find acceptance. It made me cry so many different times, but it's also about Ben finding their way in so many different ways and through the help of so many different people. This is also a wonderful romance. There are a few books that I'm talking about in this video that are romantic, but they're a little bit few and far between, like that's rarely my focus when I'm reading and that's rarely the type of story that stands out as a favorite of the year, but that is part of what made this book so lovely is the growing relationship between Ben and Nathan. This book just felt like a striking debut, something that so many people are going to be talking about and reading and loving, and I'm so grateful that I got the chance to read it in 2018, so I had to talk about it as a fave of that year, even though it's going to be a couple of months before everyone else can read it. Alright, from this point forward, these books are going to be ranked, so I am working up to my absolute favorite book of the year. So next I want to talk about I Was Born For This by Alice Oseman. I think it's fairly safe to say Alice Oseman became a new favorite author like of all time in 2018. There were just so many words that I read by her that hit me in my heart. So I think it's obvious I was going to talk about at least this book. This book is about two people. It's got two points of view. The first is Angel, who is this girl that is obsessed with a band called The Ark. And everything about being in the fandom for this band has really shaped what her life looks like right now. It is how she got her closest friend, who is a person that she knows only online. And it's gotten to this point where being a fan of The Ark is kind of the only thing that's getting her up in the morning. Uh, the other point of view is from a character named Jimmy, and he is the front man for the arc, and he is feeling more and more like he doesn't understand why he's doing this anymore, he's anxious all the time, he is deeply depressed, and he's feeling more and more closed in by the life that the band is kind of defining for him. So I loved this book for its celebration of fandom. I think that it does a really excellent job of explaining that fandom is not just screaming girls. It can be and that's not a bad thing, but it's a way of explaining that passion, that love for a thing is important and valid and it's really ridiculous that we invalidate women who are passionate because that is primarily what fandom is made up of. So I appreciate like the deep description of how that love is what is important and how it's often so much deeper than you think fandom. How passion for a person doesn't necessarily mean you think that you know them, but what that thing represents to you can be essential and it's important to understand that when people are passionate. The other thing that I love about this is Angel and Jimmy and their separate anxiety and depression issues that they're dealing with, where Angel doesn't really know what she's going to do with her life, and Jimmy is feeling really trapped. By the way, I forgot to even mention this, um, this features a hijabi main character as well as a biracial trans guy main character, so also important to know. I think Alice Oseman captures characters who feel deeply and who feel afraid and it is a feeling that I really relate to which is why I think I loved both Alice Oseman books that I read this year. Despite the fact that this is dealing with a very different anxiety than Radio Silence, it's still an anxiety I understand. And Angel is a character who I saw my passion for fandom in her and it helped me to understand the certain things that I'd felt about fandom when I was really really involved with it at the tail end of high school and the beginning of college. I just love both of these characters and I love everything this book celebrated and everything that it helped me 
to understand about myself, everything it helped me to understand about fandom in general. This book deals with some intense topics of mental health, and I appreciated those, but I also loved what it celebrated. And it would be absolutely ridiculous if I did this video and didn't also talk about Radio Silence by Alice Oseman, which I loved for a lot of the same reasons as I was born for this, but I loved for more specifically relatable reasons as well. The Radio Silence is about a girl named Frances who is biracial, she's also bisexual, and she is dealing with the end of school and trying to worry about university, and she's very worried that the only thing that she will ever be remembered for is that she's good at school. Despite the fact that she has a lot of other passions, including being an artist, she does a lot of art for her favorite podcast called Universe City, and then the very elusive creator of this podcast reaches out to Frances and asks if she would like to do official art. So it's about all that, but it's also specifically about Francis becoming best friends with a boy named Alet who has always lived across the street. One of the things I didn't talk about with I Was Born For This, but that I want to talk about with Alice Oseman's writing in general, is that she writes platonic soulmates, and that is a thing I feel like I don't get to see very often. Her books are about finding a person who understands you very deeply, but also knowing that that person does not have to become your romantic partner. While that's also true of I Was Born For This, Radio Silence is very deeply about finding a connection with someone who becomes your best, dearest, and closest friend, and it's okay that that relationship only ever goes that far, despite the fact that this is a story about a boy and a girl. I also constantly saw myself in this story saw myself at 17 being absolutely terrified about what was going to happen next, knowing that I was good at school but not knowing how that was going to affect the rest of my life. It spoke to my anxieties and my fears at that point in my life, but also my anxieties and fears that I still have today. It's an absolutely gorgeous book about expectations and pressures that are put on you by your parents, by the world, by friends. It's this book that feels tense the whole time you're reading it but it's because it is full of that very real pressure that you're feeling at this point in your life where you're finishing your base education and you don't understand what you're supposed to do next. Paulette also became one of my new favorite characters of all time. I absolutely adore him. He is my... He's my soft boy that I worry about still on a day-to-day -day basis, but I hope he is thriving. Ellis Oseman just knows how to write characters into my heart, and it's because she writes characters that each hold a little piece of myself, and I see that on every single page that I read. Next, I want to talk about The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. So the basic concept of this book is that it is about the world ending for the final time. Like, it talks specifically about how the world is always ending, then it rebuilds itself, and this is sort of a final ending. It also begins with a character who feels that this is the end of the world for her personally because she is looking at the body of her dead son and she just knows that this is kind of it for her. She's never going to recover from what she's currently experiencing this moment. It's really apparent because for the rest of the book, her narration is in second person and it feels very much to me like a dissociative state that once she sees this, once she witnesses her dead son, she cannot live as herself in the world anymore. She has to distance herself from everything. And it is the only time I have enjoyed um, second person narration because of that. So from a larger context, this book is about a world where natural disasters are constant and they constantly threaten the livelihood of everyone because of how strong they are. And there are people who have a control over the earth, like they are, they're born with this control over the earth that the rest of people don't have. So they have the power to save communities, to save lives, and yet they are the most mistreated members of this society. They are locked up, they are constantly talked about as being threats, as having the ability to kill everyone instead of the fact that they have the ability to save everyone. This book is very much a metaphor for a oppression from this particular point of view. So you have these three different points of view who are all dealing with particular things, and I think at the beginning there's kind of a disconnect as to how all of these storylines will tie in together, but that's actually the strength of the book. The more and more you discover and the more you realize about these different narrators, the more you're like, oh, 
Actually, everything about how this book is constructed is genius. Plus, this is a fantasy story where pretty much the accepted norm is that everyone is a person of color. Basically, every character is described as black, which also offers this particular lens of looking at oppression within a community that's not explicitly about race, but it is, and it's really genius and it's really heartbreaking and incredibly well done. There are certain nuances of how it's narrated that are absolutely brilliant. Like when I read the first three chapters of this book, I was like, this is the most incredibly written book I've ever read. I cannot wait to read more of this series because this is the first in a trilogy that made such an incredible impact on me and is the most I've enjoyed a fantasy book in such a very long time. Though I do now have to talk about the only other fantasy book on my favorites list, and that is Crooked Kingdom by Leigh Bardugo. What I think is interesting about this is that the fifth season is the start of a series I can't wait to discover, and Crooked Kingdom is the conclusion of a series. And it's interesting because when I read Six of Crows, I didn't really love it. It took this conclusion to make me care and to make me invested. So Six of Crows, in case you don't know, is set in Leigh Bardugo's Grisha version. And that first book is about six criminals coming together to pull off a fantastical impossible heist of sorts. And it's so interesting because I thought that would be the book for me because I love heists, I love cons, I love crime narratives, but that book didn't work for me. But this book did not feature a heist and it wound up being the thing that got me. It's still about crime, like, <laughs> that's the thing, is that, like, these books are about fairly morally reprehensible characters. And I think that that is what drew me to it, but also it is so intelligent in the way that it writes crime, in the way that it captures this very intricate plot of certain people that have to be in certain places. It was done so well. Also, while I couldn't quite gain an attachment to these characters in the first book, that really shifted with this book, and all of a sudden I was appreciating so much their interactions, the way that they had all been written so that you really understand how they all relate to each other. I think the first book was good, but not amazing, because it was setting the groundwork for the reasons you were going to be invested in this part of the story. I love Kaz particularly as a character, because so often in stories, especially YA fantasy, characters who are bad are made to apologize for the things that make them bad. They constantly have this internal struggle as to whether or not they will be this type of person. And what was so refreshing about Kaz is that he has been through hell and it destroyed him. And he's a bad person. He makes bad decisions. He runs this group of criminals in order to like him. He never has to apologize for that. And it was so refreshing to see. It was engaging, intricate, fascinating. It wove together characters and their different abilities incredibly well for the stories that it had to tell. It had engaging villains. This was everything that I want a fantasy story to be. It was done perfectly. It was executed perfectly, and I adored it. Next I'm going to talk about the last book that I would consider a cheery, uplifting tale, and that is Check, Please, uh, book one, Hashtag Hockey by Ngozi Ukazu. You guys have heard me talk about this a million times, and I think you've heard me talk about the rest of the ones I'm going to talk about a million times. It's almost unfair for me to put this on this list because I've been reading Check, Please since I was in college and I've read this part of the story multiple times before 2018, but it's never been able to be on a favorites list because it's never been a published book. So this is its chance. It is making up for the years that it didn't get to be on my list. So this graphic novel is about a character named Eric Biddle or Biddy. He is a Southern sweetheart. He loves to bake. He's a former junior figure skater. He's also a vlogger. And this year he is starting his freshman year at Samwell University where he is joining the Samwell men's hockey team. He's also gay and hasn't told any any of his teammates or his parents, and he's also slowly developing a crush on a current team member of the hockey team. The main reason that I love this story is because it is an unapologetically wholesome story about a gay main character. It's a little more rare for that to happen, but while Biddy has struggles, it is ultimately a happy story about him learning more about himself, about him gaining confidence, about slowly developing friendships that make him stronger and that are going to 
likely define him for a lot of his life. It's like I said earlier, I love stories that are about people coming together and relationships and love making them stronger. It's a fave trope of mine because it warms my heart and sometimes I need my heart to be warmed. But he is a favorite character of mine because he is so complex as a character. He is soft and sweet, but he can also be deeply protective of those around him, and he comes to love this group of boys so, so much. There is so much love in this boy's heart. I just think it's a brilliant coming-of-age story. I don't think college as a time of life gets nearly as much time as far as fiction being written about it, and I think that's such a shame because it is such a time of development, of understanding yourself, about becoming someone different than who you maybe grew up as, and this book nails every part of that perfectly. Next I want to talk about Darius the Great is Not Okay by Adib Karam. This is a brilliant story that I know I've talked about a lot. It is about a boy named Darius who is biracial. His mother is Persian and his father is American. And Darius has always felt very disconnected from his Persian roots. One of the things on the back, like the first line of the summary is, uh, Darius Kellner speaks better Klingon than Farsi. Um, which I think is a very good summary of how Darius deals with things. He doesn't quite feel connected to his Persian roots through his mother, but he also has a very tense relationship with his father. So his father has been on depression medication for basically Darius's entire life, and Darius is also on depression medication. But instead of this bringing them together, it actually forces a really big gap between the two of them where they just don't understand each other. And the only thing that they really share is that they both love Star Trek The Next Generation, which they watch together and Darius explains so many of his feelings and understandings about the world around him through his love of Star Trek. But with all of his disconnect to his Persian heritage, um, his grandfather, who he's never met, becomes very ill. And so Darius and his entire family, they fly to Iran and Darius is forced into this world and this family that he doesn't understand, and he's also slowly becoming friends with a boy down the road. I feel like all of that <laughs> should already explain why you, you should read this book, but it's one of the best books I've ever read in terms of addressing mental health and in terms of addressing incredibly complex familial relationships really well. Darius is depressed and many members of his family do not understand that and that is a real difficulty that he has to face. He is being pushed more and more by his father to be a certain version of himself that he doesn't want to be. This is ultimately about Darius really examining his heritage in ways that he never has before and slowly, slowly learning to connect to this part of himself that he has never understood and hopefully using that connection to explain why he feels the way he does about his father and why his father feels the way he does about Darius. It has one of the most gorgeous sibling relationships of all time. It is actually the thing that first made me cry. I started crying uh, first time 27 pages in and sobbed for the rest of this book. And the first time it makes me cry is specifically because of Darius's relationship with his younger sister, which I saw a lot of myself in. I also saw so much of myself in Darius's struggle with mental health. And I've talked about before that this is one of the books that pushed me to see someone and to uh, start taking medication for my own depression. I don't know how to talk about how much I loved this book because there were so many points that I started crying and I couldn't even explain why. I recently saw a, a tweet that was about um, it said which which book saved you, not just a book you loved, but a book that came to you in such an important moment that it saved you. And to me, this is that book. It, I'm never going to be able to fully talk about my feelings on this story because it means too damn much to me. It's going to take me rereading it so many more times before I am ever able to talk about everything that made this book special and everything that made this book perfect. All right, we are in our top three now. My third favorite book of 2018 was Homegoing by Ya Jassi. I am so very behind on this book. This was on everybody's favorite book of the year list like a year ago, so I'm really, really behind on this one, but 
It was on all of those favorite lists for a reason. So this book begins in Ghana in the 18th century and it follows two half-sisters. One marries a white Englishman and is moved to Cape Cod Castle where she lives out her life in comfort. The other half-sister is sold into slavery and winds up living in the dungeons of that exact same castle. And then every other story of this book follows a descendant of one of these two sisters through hundreds of years of time, through so many generations, as you just come to understand the different lives that the same family line has led. What I think is so incredibly masterful about Homegoing is the fact that you get each character for one chapter of time and that is it. And yet, I loved every single one of them. I felt for every single one of them and the different things that they were going through. I was sad to say goodbye at the end of every chapter, but so excited to meet someone new that I knew I was going to care about. This book is about inherited pain, and that makes it difficult to read, but so worth it. And I think that that theme is part of why when I read the last chapter, I sobbed for about every single page of that final chapter. It broke me, it came together in such a way that I didn't know how to even deal with what I was feeling anymore. I had come to love every single character and I was so sad to say goodbye to the story, but so hopeful that maybe this generational pain could be mended in even the smallest of ways. This is a book that opened my eyes to the fact that I might want to read so many more books like it. Part of loving this book, part of falling for every chapter of this book, was discovering that I wanted to open the horizons of my reading so much farther. My second favorite book that I read in 2018 is Piecing Me Together by Renee Watson. Piecing Me Together is about a girl named Jade who lives in a very poor neighborhood and she knows that if she ever wants to succeed she's going to have to get out of this neighborhood. So she gets a scholarship at this school and she's trying to make her way there while still feeling like everyone treats her as lesser. And then she's eventually forced to become a part of this mentorship program, Woman to Woman, where she is paired up with an older student who also attended this school. So that is sort of the base description of this book, but I think what is ultimately a better description of this book is that it is about Jade being told that everything about herself is something that has to be fixed if she wants to be accepted by um anyone, by the world around her, by the school that she attends. She is told over and over again that she is too poor, too black, too fat to be accepted by the world, and she is so deeply enraged by that concept. This book is also about privilege within certain communities. The mentor that Jade is paired with is another black girl who she thinks that she's going to have a connection with because Jade is one of the few black students at her school. So she feels that this girl is going to understand her struggle as another black student at a primarily white school. But instead, this girl comes from a life of extreme privilege and Jade is really frustrated by that. This is another one of those books that I sobbed all the way through. I read this book originally from the library and then immediately went out and bought my own copy so that I can reread it and write all over it. There is a bit at the end, it's the second to last chapter, and it is a poem. And I don't read poetry that often. Poetry isn't really my thing, but reading this poem hit me in my gut and I sobbed reading it. Um, I feel like sobbing is a theme for all of these books. This is a necessary story that I want everyone to read. I want people to have to read it in school. I want it to become a new classic because Jade is so angry and every bit of that rage is so justified. I fell for every character. I fell for every page. It is a gorgeous story that I think everyone should read. Okay, it's time! It is finally time to talk about my absolute favorite book that I read in 2018. I feel like all of you can guess it. Have you guessed? I feel like you all know. My favorite book that I read in 2018 was The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. So I talk a ton about what made me love this book in another video that I did at the end of December. It is called What My Favorite Books Have in Common. If you want to hear some really deep thoughts about what this book does, 
particularly well from a feminist standpoint, you should go and watch that video. I talk about this and three of my other favorite books of all time. So this book is basically about Evelyn Hugo, who is this reclusive woman who was a famous actress at the golden age of Hollywood, but she has never really talked publicly about her life. And then she invites a relatively unknown journalist to her home, Monique Grant, and she tells Monique that she is going to tell her her entire life story, and Monique is going to write the book about it. Evelyn has this past, this thing that is known about her, and that is that she had seven husbands. That's kind of the base of her fame. So she wants to talk about that, but she also wants to finally reveal a lot of other secrets that she kept. So this book is an oral history of a bisexual Cuban woman living at the golden age of Hollywood, how she had to scrape and fight her way to get to the place that she wanted to, all of her regrets, the things that she had to do that she's not proud of, the terrible things that she did that she is proud of, and it is also about Monique, who finds herself really idolizing Evelyn, and then also having to deal with the aspects of Evelyn that she takes on, even though those aspects might not be the best. This book is really complex because it is about two complex women. Monique and Evelyn, they're not perfect people. Evelyn in particular is, has made so many terrible decisions, but this book is about their connection to one another. It is about their connection to Evelyn's story and to this history. This book is beautiful, but it's also incredibly heartbreaking. I feel like once I started crying about halfway through, it was just like on and off for the rest of the book. It's a romance, it's a history, it is an understanding of the sacrifices women have had to make, particularly queer women and women of color through the uh, 20th century. It's just a gorgeous story, and I think that this has been on so many people's favorite lists for a reason. It's perfectly perfectly written. It hits every point, and even though it constantly broke my heart, it also kind of found its way into my heart, and it's gonna live there for good, because it was gorgeous. Okay guys, that is it. Those are my top 11 favorite books that I read in 2018. How many did you guess correctly at the beginning of this video? Let me know in your comments down below. What were some of your favorite books that you read in 2018? I would love to hear, love to add some new books to my TBR. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you in another video very soon. Bye!